Free Pride was invited to attend a seminar that took place earlier on in the month of April. The Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, hosted the event titled Heteral Nationalism, Homonomicity, and the Problem of Sexual Citizenship in Trinidad and Tobago. Independent scholar, lecturer, and published author Keith McNeil as he walks us through the political, legal, and cultural climate that exists within TNT. To a large extent, and the argument is that post-colonial West Indian nationalist projects have been, have engaged in a process of heterosexualization active heterosexualization of the legal code of political discourse. And the corollary, the flip side of that endeavor has been the kind of progressive, specific othering of the homosexual as the other to the heterosexist kind of heteronationalist kind of project. And as we'll see in, in in the cases of legislative reform and legal changes and political discourse, the emphasis, the, the sort of heteronationalist emphasis is um, an emphasis on a, a progressive, specific kind of focused emphasis on procreative, reproductive, heterosexual conjugality and the expansion and sort of upregulation of that as sort of at the heart of producing proper citizens, um, and so therefore reproductive heterosexual conjugality as the locus of national development and progress, um, and we'll look at the ways that this has um, manifested in a series of, of, of registers. So in other words, citizenship has become predicated in the post-colonial period, um, has become increasingly predicated on an emphasis on correct, legitimate, respectable sex, and the policing and regulation of proper sexuality, which in turn delegitimates sexual citizenship and sexual rights for queer folks, you know, I'll just use that kind of loosely to include lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, although it's complicated if we were going to focus on each popu population or group of Experiences. Um, but what this does is this set because the, the rules of the game have become progressively heteronationalist, um, it creates pressure, a, a, a pressure towards what I would call homonormativity. Um, the idea that in order to get your to get rights to play the game, you actually have to play the game according to the heteronationalist paradigm that's set out. So that means, you know, an emphasis on straight acting. You know, this is not, probably many of you are familiar with this kind of idea, but it does create this kind of pressure for homonormativity, creating a, a, a kind of political double bind for activists, for queer folks who are interested in change and, um, and um, in their own rights, citizenship rights, um, and it also um, displaces and marginalizes those who are excluded from the homo homonormative kind of, kind of framework. So this is kind of the analytic arc of what we're dealing with. But I want to sort of take you very, in a very detailed, careful, systematic way through what's through through the, the case of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and then I want to end by reflecting on what I think is a kind of interesting, relatively unique aspect of resistance to um, sexual citizenship rights for queer folk, in, specifically in the post-colonial West Indies and in Trinidad and Tobago in particular. And in this, and in this instance, at the end, I'm actually comparing it with the United States, where it's, where it's a little bit different. I think more complicated here, the resistance to um, the, the kind of heteronationalist imperative and its resistance to progressive change um, on this front. Okay, so so let's think about the colonial legal code, the colonial Caribbean uh, set of laws. What you need to know is that 
colonial legislation targeted all forms of non-procreative sex as unnatural. And it did not, one of the critical things that it did not focus on homosexuality per se, it focused on anything that wasn't procreative, that didn't, you know, that repro didn't reproduce children. So it, it included homosexuality, of course. Um, but it also in included married people, um, and it did not, the, the issue of consent was irrelevant which is interesting as we get into the late 20th century period where um, debates and legislative issues having to do with consent and sexual violence and all these things becomes very, very, very important. The colonial West Indian laws in this regard also applied to adults and minors alike. There wasn't, there wasn't um, the distinction between adults and minors was not as salient as it became, became later. Penalties for what were known as buggery were especially harsh in the 19th century, but they were gradually relaxed as we, as the tw turning into the 20th century, they were gradually relaxed. And again, this is an important, this is salient for talking about what then happens later in the 20th century here. Um, in this context, um, the kind of late colonial decolonizing movements um, or sentiments, the kind of gathering force and the emergence of a kind of anti-colonial, decolonizing, nationalist um, project or proto-project, we might say, um, be, over time came to focus more and more on working in lower class forms of reproduction as a kind of privileged site for the redemption of the masses in order to produce proper citizens, right, to create kind of legitimate, to approximate respectability and to create citizens out of, you know, the kind of, you know, morass of concubinage and illegitimate children and, you know, you, you know that whole story. So, um, but what I'm trying to focus on and pull out here for our attention is that, so in a sense, reforming reproduction and re reforming forms of heterosexual pair bonding became an important site for, um, for redeeming um, the colonial population and producing, you know, producing a proper nationalism with proper citizens. This, of course, built on the Euro-colonial preoccupation with unnatural sex, to be sure, um, but decolonizing West Indian nationalisms increasingly upregulated a specifically heterosexual, heterosexist focus on forms of reproduction, kinship, and social relations. Um, so late colonial and early post-colonial marriage laws were under constant revision, and what happened was, over time, what were, before that point, extra legal forms of conjugality, what we now know as common law marriages and also visiting relationships, for example, those progressively be, were sort of Ex those were encompassed by it within the orbit of, of proper marriage, um, of, of, of in closer proximity to what was considered proper, respectable marriage, um, and and these laws, the expansion of the orbit of of, of um, legitimate conjugal heterosexual relations were expanded over the course of the 20th century. So in other words, the legal code reproduced and reified the notion of non-reproductive sexual practice as unnatural and per perverse, while categories of legitimate conjugality were being broadened to include more and more forms of reproductive heterosexual union. And as I said, at first, the, the first inclusion were common law marriages, which by the way, before this point were, cons were considered marriages, now we now they're referred to discursively as common law marriages, but it was, it was, that was an effect of this transformation, not, it wasn't a sort of, you know, it wasn't just always the case. And then even visiting relationships became gradually incorporated in, within this kind of umbrella of respectable heterosexual union. Now, as we get into the post-colonial period, there were a wave of feminist-inspired legal reforms in the 80s and 90s uh, reflecting global feminist um, politics, uh, 
the movement for greater recognition of women's rights in the form of domestic violence laws, sexual offenses, uh, provisions, and other family law reforms, of which much could be said. But the point here that I want to draw out is that all of these also further naturalize the notion of heterosexual pair bonding and reproductive conjugal relations as and, and nuclear family formations as in some in some cases in the legal in the legal text as in fact it was explicitly formulated as the, the fundamental building block of society. Okay? In 1998 in Trinidad and Tobago the Cohabitational Relationships Act further moved in this direction by expanding property rights and financial obligations analogous to marriage proper, um, applying only to heterosexual cohabitation. Um, but in this case, I mean, that's pretty profound actually to create, you, to expand and, you know, create property rights and financial obligations within what, you know, 50 years before would have been considered, yeah, I mean, it was, it was like a moot point. Um, so in this sense, this act too, it, um, by focusing on conjugal relationships that produce children, it again reaffirmed the, the centrality of heterosexual reproduction as kind of like the heart of the matter. And then the term cohabitant now has been mainstreamed in subsequent legislation and discourse so that, for example, the 2000, the amendments to the sexual offenses law in, in 2000 use the term cohabitant. That's just like a basic kind of key word in the discourse. Um, what is relevant to mention here before I, before I backtrack a little bit and focus on legislative changes and uh, uh, reforms, having, reforms having to do with homosexuality per se, um, Trinidad and Tobago has been a kind of role model in all of this. Um, whether it's the domestic violence laws in all of these kinds of uh, late 20th century, well, post-colonial, but especially the last couple of decades of um, le legal changes and legislative reforms, Trinidad and Tobago's legal code has been a kind of role model, um, a role model in a sense, in that it's been like the first, and then the Bahamas follow suit, and all these other territories follow suit, and then they, their codes or their reforms use language and use as a source domain what happened here. Um, and either explicitly, I'm uh, sorry, tacitly through omission or in some cases or explicitly in others, all of these legislative reforms have excluded same-sex relations. So in that sense, it really has been a kind of heteronationalist um, effort. All right, so let me backtrack again to the colonial West Indian legal code. What mattered was the sex you had, whether it was procreative in, in other words, whereas by the late 20th century, the, the issue has increasingly become who, who you have sex with. And a result, one of the effects of this has been a homosexualizing of the concept of bubble, which now, we, you know, most people think of that as the same thing, right? That's how we define it. But in fact, again, this is an effect of these changes. It's not, it's not just been a sort of constant. Um, and again, Trinidad Tobago has been a leader. Um, what I'm getting at is that the definition of buggery has been refined and focused, narrowed, focused, and homosexualized, and the, the punishment for that offense has been increased actively in the course of the century. So let me give some, let me start giving examples. The 1969 Immigration Act, Trinidad and Tobago Immigration Act of 1969, which was last amended in 2005, prohibits homosexual non-citizens from entering the country and also provides for their deportation. Now that was, as I mentioned, this act was, uh, amended in 2005 and it was not changed. So as with all of these other cases, it's not it's not an instance of, oh, well, this is a taboo subject and it's kind of left in the corner and it'll eventually change and maybe we'll get around to it. No, there's active, explicit kind of reproduction of these forms of discrimination in the legal code. Um, 
of extremely pivotal importance for Trinidad and Tobago, but also the entire Commonwealth Caribbean was the sexual offenses, the Trinidad and Tobago Sexual Offenses Act of 1986, which did a number of interesting things. It separated buggery and bestiality, which up until that time were in fact, because of the colonial preoccupation with proscribing any form of non-procreative sex, bestiality, buggery, and all, many things were kind of just in the soup, right? They were just kind of the thing that they were all together. So in 1986, the Sexual Offenses Act separated buggery and bestiality, narrowed the definition of buggery to focus on anal sex in particular, which it had not done before. It raised the maximum sentence to 10 years imprisonment for buggery. It raised and reduced the sentence for bestiality at the same time. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so the state wants you to well. <laughs> <laughs> its discourse regarding sexual intercourse, listen to this, considered heterosexual rape natural. Yes violent and um, non-consensual and therefore reprehensive, but it still literally talked, of it, talked about it as a natural thing. Whereas consensual homosexual activity was again spoken about and formulated as unnatural. So that's a very interesting kind of distinction that's emerging and the whole issue of consent is now coming on the radar screen. Um, and the, the issue of consent, I, I'm, you know, I'm focusing on a very particular thread through all this material, but the, the, the issue of consent is, came up because of reforming rape legislation, issues having to do with domestic violence and sexual predation, and, um, and the first, the Sexual Offenses Act of 1986 was, um, was not that progressive in terms of marital rape. There was a kind of, there was a kind of backing off it was a, um, a, a backing off of marital rape, and it wasn't even referred to as rape. Um, there was kind of like real rape outside the marital sphere, and then there was um, non-consensual sexual advances by, of a husband toward the wife. That was actually um, changed again in 2000, and I'll, I'll get to that. But in any case, what I want to point out is in, in this, in, at this moment, legally speaking, Politically, legally speaking, um, heterosexual rape was cons was formulated as natural, whereas non-consensual homosexual sex was was framed as unnatural. Um, and indeed, a byproduct of the new, at that time, new gender-neutral rape laws meant that there was no need for a buggery provision anymore in cases of non-consensual anal sex. Follow me, because the move was toward gender neutrality in terms of in terms of rape. So in a sense, it um, the, the effect was to narrow the sphere of the, of the buggery or sodomy statute to, pro, to prohibiting consensual anal sex in particular. Now, at the same time, the Sexual Offenses Act created a new category of, of offense called serious indecency, which was a modification of what before an inheritance from the colonial period, what was known as gross indecency, going actually back to the 20th century British legislation, the Offense of, of, Against the Persons Act. Seri the new category of serious indecency was defined, is defined as any use of the genitals to arouse or gratify desire that does not involve intercourse. Um, and that was proscribed and criminalized. However, there was, there was also a clause, a, a subsequent clause, that excludes husbands and wives, and any consensual relations between a man and a woman. <laughs> right? So in effect, again, the, the outcome is a kind of yeah, is a, is a, um, a criminalization of homosexual activity. 
1986 Sexual Offenses Act is also the moment in which female homosexual activity is also explicitly criminalized for the first time, which Yasmin Tambaya points out is a pretty poignantly ironic uh, effect of the trends toward gender equality. Um, yeah. So, okay, the, as I mentioned, the Sexual Offenses Act was amended in 2000 in order to better protect victims of sexual violence, and it extended the, 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 the kind of paradigm of gender neutrality, and also reformed, kind of further protected women within marriage. It kind of took a little bit, it de diminished the sanctity of husband's um, sort of power within, within the marital arena. However, at the same time, consensual same-sex relations became even more criminalized than ever. This is in 2000. Despite the expansion of the definition of rape, which might have otherwise dealt with non-consensual sex sexual predation of any kind. And indeed, the punishment for consensual adult buggery was increased from 10 to 25 years. This body of legislative reforms also moved toward the criminalization of HIV transmission for the first time, which is itself really interesting and important, and I am not even competent enough to talk about sort of HIV and the law and these changes, but I, but I do want to note that because it's important, and it's also the kind of rising specter of HIV and AIDS at the time was partly how all of these changes were rationalized by politicians and through the legal process. Oh, we've got to protect our, you know, the national citizenry from these diseases from outside and this gay thing coming in. Um, okay. All right, so meanwhile, in 1999, the UNC government at the time withdrew Trinidad and Tobago from the 1969 American Convention on Human Rights and the motivation for doing this was as a kind of dissident move against, in, you know, because Trinidad and Tobago, there's some enthusiasm for the death penalty in Trinidad and Tobago. And so the UNC government in 1999 pulled out of the American Convention on Human Rights, um, which was established in 1969, in order to decrease the, government of, the government's um, obligation to honor the strictures of that international human rights instrument, which, which was against the death penalty. Now, so, but, but that, being a signatory to that convention meant, uh, it implicated a whole series of state protections against certain forms of discrimination. So what the government did at that time in pulling out of the, that convention, the government of Trinidad and Tobago legislated in its stead the Equal Opportunities Act, which, if you're paying attention, you probably know something about these days. Um, and the Equal Opportunities Act explicitly protected a whole range of categories of experience from discrimination, you know, sex, um, origin, religion, there's a, you know, there's a list of them. However, it doesn't just leave out sexual orientation from its roster of protected categories of experience. In fact, it explicitly said, we are not protect, sexual orientation is not included in this, in this legislation. It wasn't, so what I'm saying is it wasn't just left out, oh, this is a taboo topic, we're a little afraid of dealing with it, it's, no, we're going to specifically exclude you from protection by the state. Okay, as you know, the PNM under Manning was notoriously homophobic. Um, perhaps the most kind of um, well-known or infamous case on the international stage was in 2009 when Manning was chair of Chogum. And, um, at the time, you know, there was a fierce international controversy raging because in Uganda there were legislative reforms in Uganda proposed by um, uh, Yoweri Museveni in order to 
make it law that you would, that if you knew about any homosexual activity, you would have to report it to the state. Any convicted homosexual activity would be life imprisonment, and any homosexual activity that transmitted HIV would be punished by death. Right. So this was this is a huge this was the issue burning at the Chogyam meetings, or one of you know one of the big ones. And at the time, in the face of that, as Chair Choga Manning said, we are not we will not be concerned. Or he dismissed any proactive or progressive attention to homosexual concerns or gay rights in the face of this in the face of this controversy. And in effect, basically saying, okay, each country has their own sovereignty to do what you want. We get our death penalty. You get to have your you know Uganda gets to have whatever whatever they, they want to do. All right. So, and this PNM rhetoric continued in the run-up to the May 2010 elections here that brought the People's Partnership into power, including depicting their opponents as overly liberal in order to woo the conservative Christian vote, stuff you, I'm sure you know. However, I want to point out that the PP coalition was actually, in fact, not that much better um, in this sense. For example, um, Kamla Prasad Brissessor touted referenda as she, regarding abortion and homosexual rights. She said, well, we need to have referenda in order to deal with these issues, which is, I, I'm very critical of that. That's not, that sort of looks like democracy, but it's a way of kicking the can down the road and letting the population, basically the bias of the population rule. And I think it's, it's, it's yeah, it's not acceptable. Um, that's one case. She also, a little less under the radar, but was wooing the evangelical vote by promising to protect marriage. And she even touted the UNC's 1999 Equal Opportunities Act as, hey, look, you know, we did this. You know, you don't have to be worried about us being too liberal because look at what we did when we were in Another example is Makandal Daga, who was then COP candidate for Laventil West. He used his electioneering speeches to rant against the failure of national institutions, and his first instance was how schools are producing homosexuals as a sort of sign of how, how um, national institutions are, are failing. Um, still, after the people's uh, Partnership's successful election. Uh, Kamala surprised everyone in her Indian Arrival Day speech, um, in which she did include sexual orientation. At, and it's interesting too, was the Mahasabha, was the Mahasabha's um, Indian Arrival Day celebrations in which she, um, in which she made this speech. I have it somewhere. Um, she included sexual orientation in the list of wrongful forms of prejudice and discrimination that are unfair and wrong. Um, but things kind of have gone downhill since that time, is my estimation. Um, for example, in December of 2010, the government abstained from a vote at the UN with regard to an amendment restoring sexual orientation to the language of a resolution condemning extrajudicial summary and arbitrary executions. Um, that provision had been blocked, had been recently blocked by um, a coalition of African Arab and Muslim countries. And what's especially interesting and dramatizes Trinidad and Tobago's position is the fact that the majority of independent Caribbean uh, nations, including Jamaica, backed it. But Trinidad and Tobago, nonetheless, abstained on that, on that vote. Um, and as um, so, what that means is that the government didn't have a position on basic right to life, um, based on even if it's illegal. Like, I mean, if you, you know, do gay people have a right to, you know, not be summarily or arbitrarily executed or executed? The government didn't have a response. Meanwhile, the specter of same-sex marriage arose in the context of parliamentary debate in February of last year, um, in the context of debate regarding the statutory authorities amendment bill, which extended state, state support 
to heterosexual spouses of deceased civil servants, as well as expanded those benefits to common law couples. So if there was a common law marriage and one of the spouses was a civil servant, then there were state benefits that would accrue to the deceased, you know, the widow or widower of that, of that civil servant, including in a, in, a, in a common law conjugal pairing. Um, and in the, I mean, probably some of you know that in the, it, was in the, it was in that debate that independent senator Korean Baptist McKnight observed, she said, but hey, you know, shouldn't we be talking about same-sex marriages? Um, and she was in, interrupted by government senator, Senate leader Subhas Kandi, who reminded her, which it turned out after the fact was incorrect. Um, he said, but what about ch chapter 52 of the book of Le Leviticus, which was actually an incorrect, um, he got it wrong. Um, and debate was then quickly squelched in Parliament. So it is worth reflecting on or considering the palpable irony of a Hindu politician invoking biblical morality to support a form of discrimination in an ostensibly secular Parliament. Right? Now this, I'm going to get back to when I, at the end when I talk about some I think, the kind of complexities of resistance to change in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, um, involving religious, the kind of religious cultural politics. But before I do, um, I want to point out that in June of last year, the Equal Opportunities Act was amended last year in order to update and ostensibly modernize it. However, sexual orientation was again explicitly excluded from the roster of entitled protections. In fact, things are moving on this front in relation to this bill right now. There's agitation for change. Unfortunately, Jackie and Tamara are here, but there are two lawyers who are spearheading a Tell Your Story TNT project in which they are documenting um, cases of discrimination to, protect, to um, present to the Equal Opportunity Commission because the Equal Opportunity Commission says people not People, don't, people aren't discriminated, no one's complaining, so why should we, why should we change anything? So their, their project is to systematically document cases of discrimination in order to actually have to substantially put it there and say, yes, actually, people are afraid because they're not protected, and, but here are some cases and this is why it needs to be changed. And this amended Equal Opportunities Act now sits next to the Cohabitational Relations, Relationship Act and the Domestic, Violent, Domestic Violence um, Act, all of which now specifically exclude sexual orientation um, from state protections. So, now, if you think that I am being overly pessimistic or critical, um, I will, I mean, you know, for the sake of precision, we need to acknowledge a few positive glimmers of tentative hope on this otherwise weak politico legal horizon. One, in October of last year, the government accepted the UN, the United Nations Human Rights, um, uh, what is it? Human Rights Council's periodic review, the international reviews. And that review, last year's review said the government of Trinidad and Tobago is not is not protecting their citizens in this regard, and it needs to do a better job of that. And actually, this, gover this government did acknowledge, they accepted it. They said, okay, okay. Um, which is better than a decade ago when the government actually claimed in the face of a similar kind of critique from the UN that there was no discrimination against, um, related to sexual orientation in Trinidad Tobago. So if you call that progress, things are getting um, the Data Protection Act, this, is, this, is, this point was brought to me by Colin Robinson, who I respect enormously. The Data Protection Act of 2011 includes sexual orientation among the areas in which an individual's right to privacy is ensured. So, which is, I mean, this isn't a massive major thing, but it is, it is embedded explicitly in the legislative text of this, of this act which 
is important, but also could create you know, a small little trickle of precedent for other changes. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that. Indeed, we're dealing with a very complicated situation. Um, the, the government of Trinidad and Tobago also remains signatory to two OAS, Organization of American States, resolutions adopted in 2008 and 2009 regarding sexual citizenship rights and the necessity of state protection against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and I am given to understand, although I don't know that much about it and I don't ex exactly know how to characterize it, but I'm given to understand that the national judiciary has recently adopted self-imposed guidelines for curbing discrimination based on sexual orientation within the legal process. That's actually something that I'd like to find out more, and I just haven't got a chance to have the right connections yet. Um, so yeah, I want to acknowledge that there are, you know, we're dealing with a very complex situation, and there are, you know, government, the law, politics, and these are a lot more Leviathan of all of this is, is a complicated thing. So there are changes and um, uh, microscopic changes that are worth many positive changes that are worth many. Yet I think our optimism for progressive change must be tempered by taking the longer political, legal trajectory into account in which ostensibly gender progressive trends across the, re the region in, le in terms of legislative reform concerning family law and sexual violence have also in fact actively catalyzed homophobic retrenchments in political discourse and national legal codes, especially in the case of Canada today go as we've seen. And I'll bring us our attention back to the currently pending national gender policy, which is literally about to happen it seems. Um, this policy has long been in the making. Um, it's just on the cusp of being passed under this government. However, in line with what I've been saying, I want to point out that a similar dynamic is also being played out again. What's happened is that certain kinds of, you know, legitimate, progressive, um, feminist-inspired changes are being implemented and um, operationalized in this policy. However, the original draft policy submitted by our very own IGBS in 2004, which included sexual orientation and reproductive rights and abortion issues as part of the draft policy, have been gutted in order to get it through. So it's been de-radicalized in order to get to this point where it can be passed. But I think it's yet another, it, you know, it's another, it, it's, a, it's symptomatic of the same longer kind of four or five decade process in the post-colonial period in which gains are made at the expense, certain gains are made at the expense of others. And it's not really nilly, it's not haphazard. Um, and I think all of this co corroborates the critical feminist analysis of, as I mentioned at the beginning, Jackie Alexander and Teresa Robinson, that that there's a certain kind of coercive and punitive heteronationalist post-colonial heteronationalist project in the West Indies um, that, has, that has unfolded over time and has, in fact, in, in some important ways, ironically de-radicalized the kind of critical, radical edge of gender as, as not only an analytic but a political construct. Um, and Robinson has written quite, I think, um, compellingly and importantly about how how the notion of vulnerability has also gotten progressively feminized and there's a kind of a kind of um, so that the state becomes the patron of feminine vulnerability even if it's not vulnerability of women necessarily. I, I can't I can't reproduce her her analysis of all of that, but but it does include so as a final, okay, yeah, a final, let me just offer a final reflection because as, as an American anthropologist who knows the American scene well and has been coming and going from Trinidad and Tobago for 14 years and tracking the scene here as well, um, I do think it's interesting to, I mean, I've gradually dawned on me that the resistance to 
progressive change in the relating to the issues that I'm talking about here, um, I think are actually more complicated than the United States in, in several interesting ways. Um, and it's complicated on both sides of the political spectrum, both the right and the left sides of the political spectrum. So let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. On the right side, of, I mean, and when we think of resistance to change in this regard, um, you know, we automatically think of conservative religious, perhaps conservative religious opposition to, which is definitely there, and, and, and it's that piece that is similar to the U.S., the American situation. But what's, what's going on here, and that I think makes it more complicated on the right side, is that because of the pluralistic, I mean, it's pluralistic religious situation in the U.S., but the, but the, but the loudest, most effective, and pretty much the, the biggest voice against, critical voice, is the conservative Christian voice. Whereas here, there's an interreligious kind of ecumenical solidarity that can develop between conservative Christian, Hindu, and Muslim opposition to, um, to sexual citizenship rights in this regard. And I think it actually, uh, I would venture to say that it strengthens that, that religious opposition because it's not just the sectarian interests of one tradition, but in fact, people can look across their, you know, look into the other and say, hey, we're, this is one area where we can lock arms and, you know, uphold tradition and supposedly defend family values. Um, and as someone who's been tracking both Hindu and African religious practices here, I'm, I've, um, I'll also point out that there are now aspects of not just the spiritual Baptists, but, but even in the Orisha movement, there's a kind of family value, there's a, there's a family value, a, a, a kind of conservative reflex um, that has developed that is worrisome. And, you know, for example, there's a, um, what was the talk show on Gael, the women, the children, Pardon? Yoga. Masya. Yes, yes, yes. A couple of years ago on her talk show, they had they had Colin Robinson, Luke Sinnott, but then they had one of these Pentecostal megachurch pastors from um, Shiguanis and an Orisha priest. And, I mean, for me, someone who's written about and actually tracked the development of the Orisha movement over a number of decades, to see someone, you know, a representative of a movement that was originally a radical, anti-Christian critique of kind of Christian false consciousness and, and so forth, to see someone, I mean, I'm not saying this is everyone, I'm just saying that now there are elements of this, to see an Orisha, an, a sort of ensconced Orisha priest sitting on t a talk show next to a Pentecostal evangelical preacher and agreeing that, you know, gays are a problem and their abomination is sobering, uh, to put it mildly. I've also recently, just a couple weeks ago, I, I um, learned about an Orisha shrine in Laventil that has explicit, uh, painted outside on its walls, it says no gays. I actually, I, I photographed it because I got in from Puerto Rico last night at midnight. I didn't have a chance to get the whole PowerPoint presentation together. But it says, it's, it explicitly says, no gays. And on the other side of the entrance, it says, women must be properly dressed. So again, there's a kind of, there's a sort of gender, there's a conservative, regressive gender politics being played out that, um, that, yeah, that, that scapegoats gay people. Um, in a domain that, in certain ways, at least at the grassroots level anyway, has provided a kind of alternative space for gender and sexual expression compared to the state-sanctioned, so-called established, you know, religious traditions here. I have one more point, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to make two observations relating relating to kind of conservative resistance to. Uh, progress in terms of sexual rights. We have this more complicated conservative religious, ecumenical, interreligious kind of 
front on the right side of the political spectrum. But because we're also, because this is also a post-colonial context, there's also resistance on the left. There's leftist resistance as well, which is secular. It has, doesn't have to do necessarily with religious tradition. So you have the anti-neo-colonial position, which says, we don't need your European gay king here. So you have people like Michael Harris who are writing about it in this way, who articulate this position, who say, you know, we don't need this because this is an outside imposition. So it's an anti-neo-colonial, it's a secular anti-neo-colonial position on the left, right? So we have a more comp I'm just, I'm just working with a heuristic contrast between the, the, Amer the cultural po politics of the American situation versus here. So you have a kind of more complicated situation on the right, but then you also have this anti-neo-colonial dynamic playing out on the left. And then, so that makes an extra level of kind of strange bedfellows um, in terms of uh, you know, resisting, upholding the, in the language of this um, talk, upholding the heteronationalist post-colonial project.